Hello and welcome to the Master Arts Series, which is made possible by a grant from the Naperville Sunrise Rotary Club. I'm your host, Barry Skirkus. I have traveled to the Alaskan Inside Passage to talk to the current generation of totem pole carvers. My journey takes us to Ketchikan and the Edwin C. DeWitt Carving Shed in Saxman Village. There I will talk to Fred Trout and Donnie Barnell. Fred Trout will show us his latest works and the tools he uses to create them. Donnie Barnell will talk to us about his work, the history, and the future of totem pole carving. We will begin with Fred Trout, so please join me as we go to the Edwin C. DeWitt Carving Shed. So the theme of this pole is all of our ancestors, and the top figure is a grandmother with a dog salmon headdress. And beneath this figure there is a seal right here. And on each side there's eagles on each side and the Tana copper shield with the design on top of it. And then beneath the main figure is a grandfather with the headdress that actually represents all sea creature life. Okay. And it's kind of just yeah. hasn't been drawn on there yet. It's kind of rough yet. Right. And what and type then, of medium do you use to draw on this? We use the uh, China markers. Okay. They're real nice to draw right. on the web. Right. And you could so just sand and them off or do you just, just carve them off carve as them off. we okay. sculpted. And then we use uh, graphite pencils are real good too. Yes. And then there's an eagle Ebony is my favorite. <laughs> yeah, and then there's an eagle here. Okay. And then coming down the pole, there's a large raven. Okay. See this right here. Right. And then the, the beak is actually got from over a medicine woman of the north, they call her. Okay. So I was talking to an elder, and he was uh, talking to me about, um, I was talking about shamans, about medicine men, and I asked him about medicine woman, and he said they weren't unheard of. All right. So I went ahead and showed my respect because there's some women that practice natural medicines and stuff like that correct that i know of so i'm showing my respect for them excellent and call this woman the medicine woman of the north and then there's a mink here and one lady that i'm thinking of follows under the raven mink clan okay is um is some medicine woman that i'm thinking of and that kind of falls together that's why these figures are here that's why the, the mink's actually coming out of the medicine woman's mouth here all right and all the figures that are coming out of the mouth continuous down the pole is passing on wisdom and knowledge to the younger generation that's down towards the lower portion of the totem pole here. Okay. So, and the mink is actually coming up over a human bear transformation. All right. And then there's an eagle coming out of the human bear. It's still a little bit rough. You see the eagle coming out of the, the mouth right. here, where the tongue is. And then there's a woman here, and the child with the woman hat, mm -hmm. and eagle at the base. So it has both the main motifs, the raven and the eagle, Correct. which are both the main motifs for this area a lot of other subclans on this pole that have special meaning to me as an artist mm -hmm. but to, mainly this pole represents all of our ancestors so not just the clinkets which i belong to the clinket clan all right but it shows my respect for all the natives excellent now i know the traditional poles they used to have like six feet that they would put into the ground and nowadays what they're doing is they're hollowing out the back and then they're mounting them onto other large posts that are on concrete bases is that what this one's designed to do? Yeah, yeah. There'll be a pole attached in this one, okay. so it's hollowed out, and then that would be like lag bolted to the back, and then. And uh, one of the questions uh, that I'm sure a lot of the kids will have is, uh, do you have to cure the wood before you uh, start carving it, or do you carve it uh, after you debark it? What's what's the process? The sooner the better. The softer, it's nicer to carve, and it's not so dry and brittle. It doesn't fray okay. so much as you're carving with it. So uh, softer, so when it's green, it's much nicer to carve. Excellent. And uh, where do they, I, I, you said this earlier, you harvest them from this local area. Do you contract uh, loggers to bring them in for you or is it from uh, uh, private owned mm -hmm. land or? In here it's Cape Fox Corporation. Okay. And um, I'm one of the shareholders that actually belongs to Cape Fox Corporation. Alrighty. And uh, they actually run the tours out here. Okay. So, and we don't get paid hourly to work in here. All so right. we slowly works off of our commissions. So they donate us wood. So when we go to the sort yard, when they log, we get to go hand pick what logs we want. Oh, how nice. So I only have one 20 footer out here left. So I'm getting down kind of low. So, <laughs> so you got to go back <laughs> out to the lumber yard. Yeah, so. yeah, that sounds pretty good. And then what do they do? They just, just uh, transport them up here by uh, truck. And uh, uh, the next step, do they debark them? down there or do you do that? No, we do all that. We debark it and uh, Nathan has a, a real large 40, 38 footer that he's prepping outside. Uh huh. And they had to take all the bark off of it prior to uh, starting it. Okay. So. And how long does that process take? 
to debark? Um, probably just a couple days. One full day debarking it probably because you have, sometimes you have to use a big uh, commercial ship ads. Okay. Which we have one right there. Right okay, I see it. And uh, do you use some of the uh, bark and give it to some of the uh, weavers in town? or? No, the bark is actually the, the called the cambium layer. It's the new growth of the cedar and it's only harvested a couple months out of the whole year. Okay. And um, it's probably too hot in the season now. It was just, it was perfect about two weeks ago. All right. So uh, it might be in some places it still might be ready, but it's so we had a hot, such a hot summer. Okay. That only two months out of the whole year, you can actually go pull some of the bark off of it and you never want to abuse it. Correct. We always do a little blessing and take just a little portion of the cedar bark. Correct. And uh, we strip it, there's a process. And if it's, if you wait too long in the season, what happens is it's too woody. Okay. You peel it off the tree and you take the outer bark off of it. I've done it before, so. Okay. So I've taken a weaving class. I actually wove a basket. So Did it come out <laughs> I just wanted to learn a little bit about it. So I took a class and good, good. learned how to prep cedar bark and I go out and get it for you know cedar rope and uh -huh. for cedar bark hair and stuff like that. So. Excellent. Excellent. And uh, another question I know students would have is uh, where do you uh, obtain your tools? The tools we will hand make certain tools, like if we get into a certain area we need to make a, a special tool for a real tight area. Yeah. Correct. Well, to make some custom tools, but some tools are commercial, like like this tool here is right. commercial, and then some are handmade that we make, and other commercial tools, slicks and right. skews and gouges. And who is your main supplier for tools? For tools, um, probably for gouges and stuff, Swiss tools probably okay. one of the you know correct top ones, and the dive set tools, which are they hold an edge pretty good, the temper is okay. pretty good. And I'm, I'm sure you have to order them from a supplier and they have to be shipped in. Yeah, this one's not really, this guy you just pretty much have to hear about him and then you can get catalogs and he okay. pretty much hand makes them himself. Oh, so. how nice, how nice. So sometimes it takes a little while to get the nice. Right, one. right. Yeah, so. uh, traditionally they would make, uh, uh, natives would make their own tools and where would they find their material to make their tools? They would use uh, stone, bone, obsidian, jade. Um, and antler stuff like that. Okay. And then beaver teeth is a good one. I mentioned that one though. Okay. So that's some of the tr more traditional style tools. And then, and then some of the first metals actually, well, you probably know are from um, old Japanese cargo ships that wash up our beaches. And right. some of the natives would kind of go out and salvage some of the first metals off some of the ships. So take the iron and, and pound it and yeah. uh, heat it, and then uh, so pile each it. of us artists will make our own tools. Um, Excellent. We've, we've made. Um, I mean, I've made adzes and you know pounded tools out and mm -hmm. so i know about tool making and i've i've taken about three different tool making classes myself so excellent and uh how often you have to sharpen your tools as you're working all the time all right and uh um is there a secret to the sharpening technique um i've used i really like the japanese whetstones okay and then unless unless they they really need it then you can go back a few stones like some Arkansas stones or some uh, rough Japanese stones are pretty good. Okay. And then if they really needs a lot of touch up, you can even use like wet and dry, dry sandpaper. All right. Like 400, 600 grit to 2000 grit. Mm -hmm. And then go all the way to the Japanese, which is all the way to like 8000 grit. Okay. Which is super fine. So if, if you don't lose your edge, edge and you can go back to those finer stones and then hone it and it holds it for a while again, you know, so. And if it, it say for example, you lose your edge, you have to uh, get a burr on it. Um, usually by sharpening it on one side and then going through the process again to get your blade. Yeah, and you know sharpening, you would think it's it's pretty easy to learn, you know, but it takes years to, it, to get It takes many sharpening. years to learn to sharpen. My first few years, it. I mean, I spent hours on one knife, you know, now I could touch up a knife within no time, just getting familiar with just around in the, the metal or whatever, you kind of work that edge, you know. Okay. Do you ever use a mallet when you're rough cutting this out? Oh yeah, yeah. I use a mallet all the time for all these rough areas, like when we do a chainsaw cut. Okay. I could do a, I could do a little bit, just about everything if you guys want. Me to. Oh sure, that would be excellent. I know I'm not the native looking carver that you guys are probably looking for. No. Oh no. <laughs> Actually, well, yeah. Can can we take you to the makeup trailer and fix that? <laughs> no. <laughs> I've done all that with Martha Stewart. I'm not going there. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, I mean, we get you some dark hair. Their film crew came through, actually, and tore this place apart. They put rollers in here, and they had rollers going back and forth, and oh, she actually trend. bypassed this place. 
but she went up to all the other locations, but You're she kidding. narrated it. I sent a Bentwood box to her show. She had a Bentwood box sitting next to her during a narration. Right. And she had some woven, uh, did you see the show? No, no. She had some woven baskets sitting on top of the, on my Bentwood box. One of my clients loaned it to me and I shipped it to her, to her studio and she borrowed it for the, for the show. They did all the specials on all the cars in here. Oh, really? Yeah, and then they had a special on me bending boxes. I have a copy of the tape. Oh, you do? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that shows me steam bending a box from scratch from one piece of wood. Now, when you do your steam, I know, I know there's several different processes. Do you just use the water and steam? Uh, I know some commercial uh, wood benders use the ammonia gas in the steam. Yeah, I've never tried that. Um, I pretty much just use a pressure cooker. And, uh, well, traditionally they're done in the ground, you know. Uh huh. Gather some nice rocks without any cracks so they don't pop the fire, get them red hot. And then you cover them up, put them, dig a hole in the sand and put hot rocks in there and then put water on that. Steam them for about 20 minutes, put twigs down. Okay. Put your board down and then cover up the whole skunk cabbage and put sand, wet sand, pat it down. Okay. And, uh, I know the traditional way how to make it, and I did one during culture camp one year. All right. At the old village at Kirk Point, where Great. K Fox originally was. Okay. There's old photographs up there that are facing outside the beach. That's where we actually had the um, culture camp, and I did one the traditional way. I was kind of scared. Oh, and it worked? Because the dry steam. <laughs> yeah, it worked. <laughs> I heard a little bit of, when we were bending, I heard a little bit of, because it was dry steam, right. it wasn't the right. moist steam that I was looking for. Uh -huh. I should have pre soaked the red cedar, but. Um, okay. But anyways, it's, it bent okay, but I was kind of, oh no, it's gonna crack or break, you know? <laughs> you know, I haven't really had too many over the years, so. Right, right. This is Dennis, man, he's another carver in here. Hi, Dennis, nice to meet you. This is Ron, my videographer. Yeah, I guess. <laughs> You're on video now. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> Real professional, huh? You got a, yeah, got a camera guy and everything, huh? So, uh, so anyways, that's, so we did that traditional way there and, uh, and that was a lot of fun, just doing it the traditional way. Like I said, I was pretty scared. But, but nowadays we use a, a pressure cooker and have a hose going to a steam box. Okay. And, uh, and so I what is your steam box constructed of? It's at? basically just out of plywood and it's just to cover each kerf. Okay. So I have a piece of plywood going to each side of the box for each kerf. All right. And then I have a cloth on each side with little clamps and then I have hose going from my pressure cooker to the steam box. All right. And I steam each kerf for about 20 minutes with hot moist steam. All right. And make sure that this penetrate and that hot moist is going through that. And again, you're clear. using the uh, uh, Pacific Red Cedar? Yeah, and using? Yellow Cedar. And Yellow Cedar? Yeah, traditionally. And how thick are your uh, pieces of uh, plank? I usually go half inch half thick. Inch. Yep. And if you look at a lot of the old ones in the museums, a lot of them are at least half inch or a little less than that even. Okay. And then when you come to uh, doing your joints where the two ends meet, what type of uh, lap joint do you use? Okay. For, for, yeah, for mat. when you're bending your backs all the way around? Oh, it's a certain style curve. It's just a matter of cleaning it out, it's like taking a board, like laying a board out like this here. Uh -huh. It's just a matter of cleaning three quarters of it out, going about three quarters of the way deep. Uh huh. And this is the most traditional style. These are kind of rounded. Okay. But see, you could use some power tools to get some of that material out. Like I use a, um, sometimes I use a cordless Makita and I do it a 45 this way. Correct. And then I do another, oops, sorry. And then I do another cut through there. And so basically this is all cleaned out. So this actually ends up being over here. Okay. Like this corner is going to be down here and this is over here. Excellent. I can do a little ads in two if you guys want. Sure, that would be excellent. Actually, I made this one, this blade's a commercial one, but I made one a little bit nicer than this one. Uh -huh. But it's a little bit smaller, so I don't use it quite as often. This is kind of one of my favorite tools. This is a crab apple handle that I made. Oh, very Looks nice. like it's falling apart, but I can tear off two inch chunks for you. Oh. I mean, lip ads is made for cross grain cutting, for tearing okay. off big chunks. We pretty much sculpt with these, like guys, you know, work with chainsaws. All right. We can pretty much sculpt with these, and then texture too. We can take off the littlest bumps, like I'll show you here. You can take off the littlest bumps, and accurately, once you get familiar with this tool, you can even leave little texture marks on the pole as you're, you know, as you're adds in it. Mm -hmm. You're letting the tool kind of do, the, do its work. You see, I can take off the littlest bumps, so I can almost play, play with this guy too. Correct. Not only that, but I can do a lot of rough work with it too. You can see it needs to be touched up. It's kind of tearing the fibers just a little bit. See that? Right. And right. sometimes I need to switch this way too because of the grains. Because of the grain? Yeah. Um, is there any time that you really have to pay attention to the grain uh, with the knot in it, especially, uh, so the wood won't tear? 
Yeah, you have to be real careful. The knots are pretty much a, a good challenge for any good artist out there. And uh, because of the swirly grains, every time you like, once, once you shape something, you can go that same direction. But on these guys, if you go that same direction, it's gonna tear it and rip down inside of it. So you have to constantly work towards the knot. So you're working uh, around, around it and, and to towards it. the sun. Yeah, you have to kind of work that same plane but once you get so close to it, it's kind of tricky, so you have to really be careful. Like there was some patches I did up there on real, the real punchy knots that are real soft. Mm -hmm. We'll patch them. Okay. So. That's great. Yes. Let's see. Now, you were explaining the totem before. Is this a commission piece for you? Yeah, this is a private commission. The lady has a place called the Alaska Totem Trading Store. Okay. It's just north of town. It's right by a Totem Bite State Park. All right. All right. And uh, she came through last season and commissioned to it. Excellent. Earlier in the season. Excellent. So. And how long have you been working on this piece? I've been working on this one going on, this is going on my eighth month now. So. And normally, do you start with uh, the log and then cut the back half off? Yeah. And then uh, draw? cartouche or cartoon or contour line figure on it. Yeah, usually what we do is once we get it down to like cut the back off and then octagon shape it, okay. then we'll get that center line down the pole and then we work off of our line drawing anywhere from one inch to one foot per scale. Okay. And then we kind of grid it out and work off that center line and then kind of go by the figures and kind of grid out this figure over here and, and you know put all those lines on there and then and then we find Put now, our shapes on there, look at our drawings, and kind of just kind of go from there, and then sculpt it and redraw as we sculpt. Right, right. So. Now, uh, I work in stone, so it's a little different seeing somebody work linearly like this. Um, if you were to uh, explain the process, do you work it linearly from the front all the way down or top down, or you do section by section or bounce around usually, as you go? Usually, the guys tend to start on the top and work their way down. But the last couple big projects, like. Uh, a 30 footer they helped Nathan with. Now that okay. was five and a half feet in diameter when we started that, that pulls out the uh, museum. Okay. The Marriott Center. All right. And uh, it was a one year project and it was five and a half feet in diameter when we started. And it was a one year project. And uh, we started on the base because it was such a big base. And we had three figures on the Correct. bottom with the Bitwood box. So we Correct. wanted to establish all those figures. And before we went up the pole, so we actually started on the base on that one. But lots of times you guys would start on the tops. Okay. So it's not, there's no any set rules, but last time to start with that. Yeah, usually when you work, uh, for me, working in stone, what I'll do is I'll look at it and I'll turn it, turn it, turn it, and see what part needs to yeah. be uh, minus or you know, get your form back into a check. So that, that's very good. I'll do a little bit more rough work right here. Okay. It's kind of hard. Sometimes I add upside down and it's kind of awkward. So you guys brought the sweater with you or what? I, I hope so. Isn't it great? This weather has been excellent. Last time we were here, it was uh, misty and 60 degrees. <laughs> so this is a, a welcome change. We're going to spoil the round. I think the weather's going to be like this all the time. Are you guys going to go out fishing? Or? Uh, I want to. Well, you guys just didn't come up for work. Well, I hope not. I'd like to take a day off. So yeah, we're going we're gonna to try to do something. We've been hiking around a bit and, you know, showing around some of the sites. So, it's been really nice so far. Maybe uh, you could uh, take your tool uh, pouch and explain some of the different tools. Oh, yeah, my use. smaller tools? Yeah, yeah, that would be pretty interesting as well. These are a few. These aren't all of them, but these are some of them. Some of these are handmade, like this one's handmade. Mm-hmm. This one's actually one of my favorite. And what type ones. of wood is? That's yew wood. Okay. Well, oh, that's nice. This one here is actually really nice. The handle's got tape; doesn't look professional. Right. But the blade's very professional looking. Mm -hmm. Now, how do you insert your blade into your handle? I inset it. I carved out a spot, and lots of times what I'll do is I'll take the grinder and I'll shape, notch it out, okay. and then I'll carve out little notches in there. All right. And I'll set it in there like that. That way it doesn't, won't give as easy. All right, and then what, how do you seal this back up? And then I put a five minute epoxy. Five minute epoxy? Yeah, close it back up again. Okay. And then like this guy here is a Japanese technique. This one I hand, I hand made myself. I ground it, I pounded out the inside. So it's a Japanese technique on the, it's called a reverse bit knife. 
Okay. So it works real good around eyes areas because it scoops out real nice. Okay. And uh, that Japanese technique's where it's hollowed on the inside, so the back edge, so you don't have to sharpen the whole outer edge like most knives. Okay. So that's really nice. That is. That's and gorgeous. it holds a holds a good temper too. And I made it so I made this handle so thin, so I can use it for bowls on the side of bowls, mm -hmm. dishes. I could lay it flat inside there. Not like some of these are too, you know, too big the handles. Correct. So this one's pretty flat, where you can actually lay it right in a bowl and use it. Oh, excellent. But excellent. I use it for everything. Do you ever else, use so. a rouge to polish your tools? A what? A oh, rouge. yeah, we use pretty much everything. Okay, okay. But we pretty much use semi-chrome mostly. All right. And here's one of my very first knives, hook knife. The blade was quite long blade, so I wrapped this around because I get so close, I cut my skin, so I just kind of put that leather piece there. <laughs> then everybody so, who's carved cut their hands. And then these are twice. some of the commercial tools. And then here's some of the very, very first tools I made. This one. Oops. Actually, I don't think my other ones are. I think just that one here. Yeah, I don't have my other tool here. This is this is one of the very first knives I ever made. The little knife. Let's see my initial on there. And you can see the different size hook blades. So we use different size hook knives. We use straight edges. And we use little round tip Cajun knives with the back is tapered. So it's really thin. So when you cut through the fibers, mm -hmm. like if you're doing detail work on two-dimensional, you can carve you can carve out an area and when you cut through the fibers, this back edge is thinned out enough to where when you cut through the fibers, it's not gonna break and fray. Mm -hmm. So have um, you ever tried chip knives? No, I don't really use I've seen some of them, like some okay. of them are alright, you know. Okay. okay. Why don't you tell us a little bit about this uh, box that you're making right now. Well this one here is actually uh, an elderly um, couple came through and they commissioned me to do this piece and they wanted um, six, well they have four kids okay. and they wanted all their kids represented on this box, all right. including themselves. So there's four kids and then those two that make six. So there's going to be one figure here, here, and here with abalone inlay. So there's three figures there and then three figures there representing and then on this back side, there'll be all the kids, all eight grandchildren on the other oh side my of the God. box. So I'm trying to incorporate all that into my design as I'm designing this. So the main figure on this side is actually a bear with all of them being represented around the bear structure. And then which I see. you can see I just do a little bit of inlay. These aren't glued in yet. I just, they're such they're tight just fit. Just, yeah. Don't take off, Miker. And then I see that uh, you have some drawings in the background. Yeah, um, this is, I'm sorry, this is for a little bit of a box. Okay. And um, you have already drawn out and used carbon paper to do your transfer? Not always. You know, sometimes I just draw right on the wood. Okay. And then I use, I do use graphite paper sometimes, but most of the time I take tracing paper, okay. do my design on one side, flip it over, tra transfer tra it. Right. So it's real faint when you see it, and then I just redraw it again. Mm -hmm. But this graphite kind of eliminates me redrawing it, but Correct. I still go back to that tracing paper. Okay. Uh, every time I do it, I just, it's so easy. Yeah, well, you is. work with tracing paper, so. Yeah. So this is for a smaller box. You can see that it was for a yellow seer box that I did. Mm -hmm. Corner design. This is an eagle design. That's excellent. <clears throat> That's beautiful. So. Did you guys get most of the video on this guy already pretty much or did you want any other shots of this one? It's, the sun's kind of beating right down on it, it's kind of cracking, that's why I want to cover it back. Right. This, is the bit, this is the box from here. Oh. This is one solid piece of wood steam bent, 10 foot board when I started. It's steam bent into a box drum, traditionally hung in a clan house. There's a design oh, on the inside, inside yeah. before I inset it and wood pegged it. So I steam bent this one, I actually have the video on this one too that I video oh, really? Yep. Excellent. I had a friend of mine videotape it while I was steam bending it. The last joint's wood pegged right here. Traditionally hung in a clan house for the uh -huh. best sound. So you beat the set the beat side of it. Uh -huh. And they have incredible deep bass sound. So when they're performed with these guys, they usually put them up. Nowadays, they put them up on the corners. And uh, their cedar rope uh, that I'm going to redo, I'll put it right here. Okay. The last cedar rope I made wasn't such a good one. And you put it up on its corner and you could beat the side of it. And it's actually a musical instrument. So it's deep bass sound. You hit it. That is very nice. Sound. Different areas too. Some guys wrap their palms and they do use beater sticks too. You can see. So it's kind of like a conga. You know, <laughs> if you hit it in the center or you hit it on the side, it changes the. And they're side. incredible. If they're, I mean, you can hit them really hard too, and they have deep, deep bass. Right. So when you perform, they kind of just send 
chills up and down your spine type thing. So excellent. They're pretty amazing. This is actually my second one I made. The first one I donated to the dance group up here. Excellent. So this is my second one. I actually made this for a local commission here in the village. Very good. Why don't you talk about this mask again? Oh, the mechanical one? Yeah, yeah. This that one's fun. This one here I did during David Boxley's class. The eyes are closed there, and it has a raven design painted on the top. There's cedar bark rope all the way around it. And I took the cedar bark rope and I opened each strand up and I went outside and beat the cedar bark and I put it through each strand, ran it through, doubled it up through each strand mm -hmm. and then I closed it up. And it wasn't real thick um, cedar rope. I wish it was a little bit thicker, but it was fine. And then I did a different design on each side. And if you look at the, the design, there's a little froggy underneath sharing the same mouth. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. And then a negative form line on this side, different design and different design. See right. it's negative form on right. this side, it's positive, positive on, this side. on that side. Mm -hmm. right. And then the eyes are open here. And it's a Shimshian style, it's not the Klinkit style, that, which I usually do, mm -hmm. but I wanted to show my respect for the teacher, and okay. I did it his style. Excellent. So, you know, I knew later on I'd make a Klinkit style one, my version, but I just wanted to do yes. his style first. Yes. That's when I helped Nathan on this 30 footer. I did all the ads work on this, you can see all my lines. Oh yeah. That's where I got a really good practice on too. I did pretty much the whole salmon. Mm-hmm. But we had a pole raising and there was a big party afterwards. Oh, excellent. I helped him with that. And there's all the, here's after the pole race and there's Donnie Barnell. Mm -hmm. And there's me. And here's all the carvers. It's Nathan, there's me, Donnie Barnell, and his son, Stephen, Stephen. Jackson. So all of us disciple <laughs> guys are behind him, the master, you know. <laughs> well, I hope to meet uh, the other guys as well. Yeah, you should meet. He was supposed to be coming back, but sometimes he goes and powers up. He starts, I think he's been coming out like 5, 6 in the morning. Okay. Donnie Varnell met with me later that afternoon. Let's go and talk to Donnie about his work. And again, this program was made possible from a grant from the Naperville Sunrise Rotary Club. Um, is this a drawing for this particular piece over here? That was, that's the, that's the drawing for the pool that's in town. Okay. Oh, that's the one by the hospital. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah, we fine. went there today and uh, took a look at that and photographed it. It's really nice. It's absolutely beautiful. Uh, why do you have that one figure upside down on it? Uh, it's just the way it kind of fit in. Okay. The, the tongues needed to connect, so it was either the raven going to be upside down or the shaman. They wanted the shaman on the bottom. Okay. So he's not really upside down, he's kneeling down. Oh, okay. And he's like this. All right. So he's, he's bent backwards. Yeah. Yeah. But some people kind of consider it taboo to put things upside down, but at the same time, if you're going to fit in a bunch of things and you want right. to do certain things, something's going to be upside down and something like that. And how long did it take you to complete that totem? It was 11 months. 11 months? Long time. How many hours? Uh, per week? Uh, 40 on the average. Yeah, I figured as much. I figured as much. I had a crew of like, three guys working underneath me. Oh, really? Yeah. And how does the uh, apprentice program work? Or the, uh, when, you first, when you first decided you want to become a carver, who did you study under and how many years did you have to do that? And when I first got interested in carving, I was hanging out, well, you, you know my family, I've met my right. family already, so, like, uh, <clears throat> you know, just kind of being surrounded by artists all my life, mm -hmm. knew a bunch of them already, um, and I was already working with other things at the time, I decided to get wood. I originally asked Nathan Jackson for an apprenticeship, but he already had two or three guys that were apprenticing with him, so I, he said no. Then the next summer, I... He was working on a project for the Ketchikan Heritage Center. Right. And Fred was apprenticed with him at the time. And I just would come over and hang out quite a bit and carve every once in a while. And then a friend of mine in Canada asked me to work on a project with him that was going to go to the Expo 2000 in Hanover, Germany. And it was an 18 foot pole. So I started my apprenticeship with him. I worked with him off and on. And Nathan, at the same time. I was working with three, four different people. Mm -hmm. So I can't really say I was working with one guy. Right. Um, so 
over the period of three years, three or four years, I just travel up and down the coast. Working Excellent. With and when you first start uh, in a lot of apprenticeship programs, uh, I could give you some of my background. I did a lot of foundry and before you're allowed to do any of the uh, work with the uh, furnace or, uh, or the burnouts or, you know, pouring, you have to sit there and watch and do skimming and things like that. Mm -hmm. So in yours, before you're able to design a totem or before you're able to, you know, initiate your own designs, do you have to first run it past somebody who's a master carver and then they would then give you the okay to uh, apply that to the piece of wood and then start carving? On my own project? Uh, no, on a project, say, underneath Nathan or... Well, he comes up with a definite plan and from his plans I just measure it out. Okay. And I know where he's going to, where, where, what he's trying to achieve. Um, the thing with working with Nathan at, this, at one, I don't really shape his poles out for him. I okay. never have. Like he'll get them going and then I'll come and start cleaning his poles for him. Okay. But with Reggie, uh, the guy I was working with, our styles are real similar so I can kind of guess where he's going with it. Oh, know? excellent. But at the same time, it, it, like when I hire people out to work for me, you, you're not going to be creative on my piece of art. You know, you're going to do what I say. You know? Excellent. Excellent. And how long did it take you to go through your apprenticeship before uh, you got recognition to have people working for you as an apprentice? Um, you know, this project was actually my first project and there was a huge debate um, at the time. People uh, felt, because I, at the time I had only been working in wood for five years, that it, it wasn't a difficult thing for me to pick up and do. Um, and I, I felt that I could make that piece and some people were questioning my prices and and whether I could do it or not, and I did it. And so that's that's the old uh, pull yourself up by your bootstraps and just do it. Yeah, so that, that's really a good thing. I know uh, uh, a lot of art students that I teach. You know, I, I tell them, I go, if you you have the gumption, you can do it. You know, yeah. just don't fall back. Just believe in yourself. So I think it's some people don't think in processes either. Mm -hmm. You know, they start going for something and they don't know how to actually get to it. And, you know, my first years in college was construction technology. And so I think, kind of think this way. I know how to like step things up and get to these areas and not just jump and undercut things because you can make huge mistakes. Correct. Um, I, you sharpen your, your tools is a very important thing. You're not going to create a, a high-end high -end piece if your tool isn't sharp. Exactly. Um, so it's really getting to know your tools and being familiar with them and what they can do. Mm -hmm. Knowing your limits at the same time. And then when you hire people too, knowing what they can do. Um, like I would hire guys for rough out and I would, you know, lay them off and then I'd bring in guys that can clean. Okay. You know, and kind of use, utilize their time and their, and their uh, the kind of the area where they're getting up. On that totem, how many uh, <clears throat> people are working on it at one time when you have it like laid out like that? Over there. In the beginning, there's one, two, three, four, five of us, and then after the fifth month, I laid everybody off, and so I could get some time with it by myself too. It's it's difficult trying to show people how to do things mm -hmm. at the same time. It takes up your time. Right. And uh, then I just started hiring out. So in fact, I hired my old master too. He came to work under me. Was, oh, how cool! That was nice. <laughs> yeah. And That's very cool. Stephen Jackson, Nathan Jackson, some came in and worked for me for about a month too. Excellent, excellent. Now, what just what made you decide on the coloration of the uh, different figures? I you'll kind of notice like like a Northwest Coast design. The primary elements. I don't know if you're familiar with structures and stuff like that. But, so. Generally, you'll find that your primary lines are black, mm -hmm. your secondaries are red, and if you have a true color, they're generally green that go in here, these areas. <clears throat> uh, the theme of this poll was uh, they wanted a shaman, they wanted an eagle and a raven to represent both the families, and they wanted a watchman on top. And I I was 
in debate at the time whether uh, just because I come from a certain school do I have to con <clears throat> continuously make that style, mm -hmm. that, that look. In a, but there's other things in a Haida style that you can pull from that people weren't pulling from. And uh, so I was just getting from different avenues instead of some other ideas. Well, um, so this pull was kind of like in this trance state. So what I did um, is I just switched the secondary colors with the primary colors. So it all went red and then all the secondaries went black kind of indicating that uh, the shaman had gone into a deeper, you know, not such a, you know, superficial or, or surface realm, but into a deeper trance, you know. Did you receive any type of comments from other carvers about uh, changing direction? Um, <clears throat> carvers that, and artists that were accomplished already and, and uh, who I have kind of a mutual respect for in their work, uh, liked what I did. I think carvers and people that um, haven't really, don't know too much about it, were the ones that complained about it. Because I don't think they have a deeper understanding of what, it, what, they're, what they're looking at. Mm -hmm. um, it's very abstract art and I think there's um, a lot of avenues that you can go with it. And, I mean, I don't think anybody really can only, they can only speculate what an ovoid actually means or what a U-shape really means. You know how to put it together. But, uh, you know, at the same time, I don't want to knock anybody else's idea of what these things mean to them at the same time. You know what I'm saying? Right. You want to have personal interpretation of a particular mm -hmm. visuals. I think that's uh, very good. When we were at the uh, Totem Heritage Center, I saw through your book here that uh, uh, one mask that uh, appears in the uh, entry slash exit way. Maybe I pass it by. This one here. Thunderbird. Yes. Can you talk about that one a little bit? Thunderbird. That was commissioned by the city of Ketchikan. Michael Nabb, the curator of the Ketchikan Museum, had been asking me to do a piece for him for a while. And uh, I just didn't know what I wanted to do. And he didn't have any money. Museums don't have very much money. But at the same time, I kind of wanted to do something for the town that I was born in that you know, I wanted to do something really nice for him. About when I first started apprenticing with Reggie, his brother is one of the more famous fellows named Robert Davison. And uh, the guy just does you know, immaculate work, mm -hmm. you know, down to every detail. He knifes everything. And he's kind of the. He's kind of the heavyweight champion of carving. I've always loved him. And uh, I went to a show in, in British Columbia, in uh, Vancouver, and he, uh, there was this piece in there that uh, he had made. It was a Thunderbird. And uh, when I saw it, I just, oh my God, I'm gonna quit. <laughs> I just, I'm not gonna be able to beat that ever, you know? So three years down the line, was it three or four, uh, Michael asked me to make something, and I'd always been drawing this this thing in, on paper. Whenever mm -hmm. I get a, if I'm just like not thinking, I'd be drawing this Thunderbird on. So, uh, well, okay, I'll make you a Thunderbird, and I made it with the same dimensions. But I noticed that Robert had gone with uh, more of an ovoid kind of deal, and he was kind of pulling for more of uh, the Southern Quag Youth people. If I'm pronouncing that right, I'm not sure. Uh, they have these cannibal bird dances and. This huge red cedar uh, mass, and I kind of saw where he was getting his ideas from. He may have gotten some ones too. I've, I've never talked to him about it, um, but I wanted mine to go faster than his, uh, and because I kind of figured he was the heavyweight champion. If we were going to get in a cockfight, I'd have to be a lot quicker. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and so, uh, so this design was based off of U-shapes instead of ovoids. Okay. And uh, I was trying to get more of a kind of a jet look, you know, quicker. Right, so piercing type. Old, you know. Right. And uh, at the same time, Thunderbird, I was thinking of cars and turbines and stuff like that and airline jets and, mm -hmm. and uh, kind of a, you know, a little updated version. Right, right. 
And what inspired the, uh, uh, the red flames or whatever you want to call these off the back? Um, what would you call these first of all? Wooden pegs. Wooden pegs? <laughs> what, but what, they, what do they represent to you? Uh, it just gave it, uh, it gave it motion, I yes. think. And I thought so too. And since it is a dance headdress, and you shake it, they... Oh, excellent. Try to get some movement out of it, but at the same time, I remember back watching this movie when I was a kid of this woman who was part porcupine or something that loved the sound that she made she shake. <laughs> and uh, another thought, um, like where I come up with these ideas, I never really chew them to one kind of avenue. I'm always kind of digesting them and bringing them back. And, um, and then you have like action shots and comic books. Right. You know, exactly. Coming in, foreshortening and stuff right. like that. This whole piece was basically a, like a drawing that I did of a foreshort, you know, kind of looking at it this way, you mm -hmm. know, how it would look like that. And then when I brought it back to more of a profile look, you know, you'd have this huge area and it would shrunk down. That's excellent. So how many drawings do you usually complete, you know, before you start uh, laying it out into like a final draft of something like this? I, I know I carry thumbnail uh, diaries and I just do dozens of them. Study. Yeah, I, you know, like I sometimes I don't draw the whole piece up. I'll do like a profile and a, and a head on for, you know, dimensions. But then when it comes to wings and other things, I like doing foreshortenings, trying to take a look at them like this. I should probably get into computers because they can move it around for me. You know? Right, right. So, where did you go to school at? Uh, I went to school my first year, Eugene, Oregon. LCC, Last Chance Community College. Okay. <laughs> um, but it was my first attempt. And then uh, I came back home and uh, did some commercial fishing and went logging and did the rowdy boy thing for a while. Yeah. And then got a nice girlfriend and she said, let's go back to college and then I went to Fairbanks. Oh, excellent. Excellent. And uh, what did you get your major in? I actually ended up getting sick in college and I never returned. I came okay. back home and that's when I actually got into North West Coast Art too at the same oh. time. Okay. I had about two, two years of uh, <clears throat> rehabilitation. And I'd already been weaving baskets at that time too. And, you know, I'd bought a mountain bike and you mm -hmm. know, just little things, entering shows with my family. Right. Um, people got a kick out of it, I think. You know, uh -huh. you know Dolores Churchill and the Holly Churchill and my mom. And uh, that right, and right. Now they're... It was kind of a sissy thing, and so I, <laughs> so I, was, you know, I didn't. Go, I was always planning to go back. I was going to go back to art school right. because my last years and or my last semesters in college up in Fairbanks were actually. I took four studio art classes, which is pretty stupid to do. And it's, Not enough time. Yeah, you spread yourself pretty thin, and right. I was getting kind of sick at the same time. So, um, um, but you're healthy now, which is important. Oh yeah, yeah, good. yeah. Healthy for six years. Good. Um, so that's, they were saying, well, start carving, make masks, make these things in the, in the summertime, and then you can go to school in the winter. And then I started applying, you know, some of these ideas that these guys, these more traditional concepts with some of the ideas and stuff that I was wanting to get into. Right. And uh, it took off. People really, you know, liked it. Right. So I never got a chance, and I started getting hired out by all these other guys, and there was so much work and there was so much money mm -hmm. that I couldn't really... Say, I'm going to give this up. <laughs> I'm going to go spend $80,000 on an education or I can get paid and get educated. Right. And I noticed that it all came back, like, my drawing wasn't that good at the time. But, you know, as you're getting these jobs and these commissions, people are saying, we want a more detailed drawing. We want these things and these right. things. And so, that you're paying you to do it. Right. And so. It's, everything's kind of come around full circle with other ideas. And I always want to make comic books too. Mm -hmm. And I'm becoming a better drawer just by becoming a sculptor at the same time. I want to make this into a token pool. But it would have glass and some other things involved at the same time. I'm trying to apply some of the more comic booky sculptural ideas. Right, you know, right. Bring it back. That's very nice. Um, and there's like this unity thing that I was trying to come up with. So there's a man and woman in here, but I'm also trying to pull out this other design. These are just quick sketches I was working right. on in the morning. Mm -hmm. Right. I like the flow. 
I like the way you're, you're trying to bring the eye movement all throughout the whole piece. That's really strong. And the repetition of the different elements is, is uh, making it very unified. That's good. Something there. So what would you conceive of this being made into? Uh, I kind of wanted to make it into some kind of anime kind of thing, actually. Watch it move. Okay. So there's so much going on, but I think I could twist and move and do some things. Maybe like just a short flick. Okay. Have you ever looked at the uh, uh, works of Red Grooms? Red Grooms, no. Look him up. I think you'll enjoy a lot of his stuff. Uh, he is a sculptor and he does things in a comic-like fashion, uh -huh. except they're really large. Uh -huh. And uh, just look him up. There's some real good books. If you go to local library, check them out. And, uh, I think you'll, you'll see that you could do three-dimensional animation as well. Right. Yeah, and his stuff is mostly made out of either fiberglass or wood. I'm a big fan of Takashi Murakami. Mm -hmm. He's pretty amazing. He's super flat. Mm -hmm. What about this one right here? Is this one going to be have your own influences into it, or is it going to be more traditional? Or uh, when I did these, this is for an elementary school. Uh huh. Uh, there's a there, the people in here give a little talk. Right. Uh, and they say, if you want a totem pole, you can talk to one of the artists in here, but realize that they are not allowed to put your favorite dog or cat on it, your favorite car. <laughs> or anything which is, you know, bull because right. they've been doing it for 150 years. Mm -hmm. You know, I've seen this really amazing piece of argillite and it was, it's quite old and it's depicting uh, a, a European colonialist man grabbing his wife by the hair and he has one of those old shotgun pistols. That, one of the blunderbusts? Yeah. 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 Uh -huh. And it was a, you know, an illustration of domestic abuse. Mm -hmm. Sticking in her face like that, and I mean, there's a lot of other things that are out there, uh, you know, carvings of whatever was going on at the time. Right. Even Nathan Jackson, he's put Uncle Sam on poles, right. flags, and right. Abraham Lincoln's on that pole out there. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. He put a cell phone on a pole. He did. <laughs> yeah. He didn't That's want excellent. anyone to know about it. And I, I didn't say it. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody will know. His son did it for him. I think. <laughs> But Steven, it was, it was, huh? Yeah. It's like Steven. <clears throat> so, uh, I naturally wanted to rebel against that, and so uh, this job came up for an elementary school, and at the time, I, I just discovered Takashi Murakami, you mm -hmm. know, and his style of doing things. And uh, I was never big into anime, a Japanese anime, that right. style. I never drew it or anything, but uh, I made an attempt and I drew up some drawings. Is that one right over here? Yeah, they, mm -hmm. they were actually more basic than that. And I sent the ideas in, mm -hmm. and they selected me out of four people to come up, and they paid me to uh, come up with uh, more sophisticated ideas. And so this one right here and this one right here, I'll go in there. Yeah, I saw that the uh, the kids were working on this with you. <laughs> well, I, so friends of mine that are actually my next door neighbors now, they. She's an architect, and she had this building made for her, her, her business. Mm -hmm. And they wanted to show it off, and they are getting a lot of their friends to uh, show some of their artwork off the same thing. But I, I didn't have anything completed. So, and I was thinking about, I like this idea. I, I'm not going to, this is going to be painted. Right. This all has right. to come off. But this was an idea that I was thinking about, and so I just went and drew a few things on it. And I laid all the crayons down, and I wanted to go see the, what was going on in the art walk. Right. By the time I came back, it was covered. <laughs> I didn't say anything to anybody, I didn't ask them to do it. I just assumed. And, uh, so I'm just checking on something. Donald's all right if I bring a group in? Sure. Okay, great. Hey, folks, welcome to the DeWitt Carver Center. This is Donald, Donald Barnell, he's one of the local carvers here on the island. island. Uh, we also have Nathan Jackson working on the totem on the far right, and the totem on the far left is being done by Fred Trout. Now, the native people called the red cedar the tree of life because they used it for so many different things. They used it for their totem poles, their clan houses, their canoes. They made 60 foot canoes that would hold 30 warriors, and they raided from southeast Alaska all the way down the coast of California, raiding and taking slaves. When they took slaves, they preferred small children. They were easy to handle, didn't try to escape. And as they grew up, they were taught the ways of the clan. When they reached adulthood, they were accepted in the clan, bringing more strength and numbers. 
Years ago, they used uh, stone, jade, shells, and beaver teeth for the blades on their tools. Nowadays, they'll take a leaf spring off an old truck and form a blade out of that. They spend just as much time sharpening on their tools as they do carving. It takes about a week for a linear foot on these totem poles, depending on how much design goes into them. Now, if anybody, you think all these carvers that are here all have portfolios out front. If anybody's interested in buying a totem pole, just talk to me and I'll be a pretty popular guy today if I can sell one. 10% fiber speed. Yeah. Okay, uh, for the totem poles here, a beginning carver will charge you about $750 a linear foot. A master carver like Nathan could be three to $4,000 a linear foot. You take a 40 foot, 50 foot totem pole, you add up, do the math, we're talking a little bit of money, okay? Okay, now colors on these totem poles. Now nowadays you're seeing some pretty colorful totem poles, but years ago it wasn't like that. The minerals that they used to make their paints was very hard to come by. They used the iron oxide for the reddish color, copper oxide for the blue-green. For the black, they used charcoal or coal if they had it. And for the white, they used clamshells. Now years, you, you can take back these native people, they never had a spoken or written language. So some of the stories I've been telling you could be thousands of years old and passed down through the years. See how he's wetting this down. They'll keep it sprayed down, covered up with plastic. Red cedar's pretty soft, it makes it easy, more pliable and easier to carve. Now these people would take these minerals that they used to make their paints and they'd grind them up into a fine powder in a stone bowl. The native women would chewing on salmon eggs. And with the oil from those eggs and their saliva, they would spin it in with that mineral and make a real fine oil-based paint. It was actually a pretty good paint. I've seen some old totem bowls and they have remnants of this paint still on it. But good luck trying to find a gal to chew up those eggs for you nowadays, okay? So you're going to tell you get your butt down to true value and get your own can of paint, okay? Because I've tried salmon eggs and it left the oil slick on my tongue for about two hours. It's for special taste, all right? Stick to your beluga caviar. Okay, now you see some uh, diagram up there, the raising of the totem poles. That's when the story was told on the totem poles. Um, they had what was called a pot latch. You can see how they made A-frames. They used ropes made out of spruce roots. And it took, they made pot latches with a big celebration, the feasting, dancing, exchanging of gifts, and the raising of the totem poles. And that's when the story would be told. So we were talking about the kids, so you came back and all of a sudden they, they, uh, they filled it in for filled you. Filled it in for you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and some adults too, there's some things written in the back. So uh, okay. Some friends of mine doing little, <laughs> little things. Uh, you, you know, I, I, I hope they didn't use crayon, did they? Yes, all crayon. Oh, geez. <laughs> so now you got to carve that off a little bit to get the wax it's off of it? Better to paint though, you know. Okay. Paint would have seeped in. All right. Yeah. Uh, you know, at the same time, I. You know, who would think of desecrating a totem pole at the same time, you know, so you're basically doing graffiti on this. Right. And, right. Uh, and when I did make it back, some kids didn't, like, they were scared to do it. Right. People were scared to do it, you know, like, uh -huh. so well, it's yeah. kind of an interesting little inter interaction, I think, with a piece of little, right. little Richard Serra idea, <laughs> you know, what are you going to do, you know, like, when you come in contact with it. <laughs> Yeah, at least they didn't pick up the tools and carve on it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I didn't leave those around. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's a smart thing. That's a smart thing. So where do you want your art to go in the future? What do you, what do you want to do? Uh, it seems like you're trying to intermix different influences in your art and different aesthetics. Where do you want to, where, where do you want to be in about five years from now? Uh, you know, I would like to do a documentary, I think. curious about ice carving. Uh -huh. You can't get paid for it. You can do really monumental huge things with a lot of these things. Uh, at the same time, trying to make a living, you know. There's things I want to do. I don't know, I, I have a lot of questions about things too at the same time that I'm trying to work out, like, not even in my personal life, but trying to parallel it with the art too. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. trying to come to, you know. Some sort of balance or harmony between the world. Yeah, but not coming to a standpoint. I want to float. You know, right, right. And uh, not limit myself to any ideas. I want to contribute to the Northwest Coast art quite a bit, but I also want to contribute to the Alaska community at the same time. I, you know, I grew up in Alaska. Right. A lot of talented people in Alaska. Oh, yes, there are. So, you know, like when they talk about. Picasso as a Spaniard, Alberta, Giacometti is a Swiss, so, right. you know, I mean, if I get like that, but, but, and I would like to, I want to make 
known as from Alaska, Alaskan Native.